All right, this is uh, EC 2002, uh, spring 2022, uh, exam number three. Ten questions, not too bad. Uh, so uh, let's let's do it. Okay, question number one in the circuit below. Find V sub C of S in S domain. Assume the capacitor initial voltage, V sub C of zero, is equal to zero volts, and the inductor initial current, I sub L of zero, is equal to zero amps. Note, do not perform partial fraction. Okay, what we have here is a zero state response question. So they have given us this circuit down here. It is a series RLC circuit uh, with these resistor, inductor, and capacitor values. And we have some input voltage, which is equal to 2e to the negative 2t uh, for times t greater than or equal to zero. Uh, and we have no initial voltage or uh, current conditions. And so all that we're going to do in order to solve this is first we are going to convert this circuit into its S domain equivalent. Right, so we are going to get the, uh, we're going to Laplace transform the voltage source and we are going to convert our uh, passive elements into their impedance values in terms of S. From there, all that we're going to do is we're simply going to perform voltage division in order to find what the voltage is across the capacitor in terms of S. And so this is a pretty straightforward question. So first let's convert the circuit. So this voltage source is equal to 2e to the negative 2t multiplied by unit step function because it's only on when times are greater than or equal to zero. And so in order to go from time domain into s domain, right, into the complex frequency domain, we need to Laplace transform this. So this is going to be equal to, in terms of s, with s being equal to sigma plus j omega, uh, 2 over s plus 2. And the way that I did that is this here, 2e to the negative 2t, the Laplace transform of e to the negative at is equal to 1 over s plus a, and so our a value is 2, and we have a coefficient of 2 multiplied here. So it's just 2 over s plus 2. So when I write that here, next we need to find the impedance values of our uh, passive elements. So the impedance for a resistor in s domain is just equal to its resistance value, and that's because resistors um, are in this ideal scenario when we're building these circuit models, they are completely uh, independent of our frequency. Uh, in the real world, that's not exactly true, but it's sort of true. And when we're modeling things, that's what we assume. Uh, and so then the next thing is the impedance of our inductor, and this is equal to L times S, right? So this is the exact same uh, way we found impedance for inductors in 2K1, right? But instead of having just J omega, we now have this sigma component. And what that does is, we're no longer working just on the J omega axis where we have you know, some periodic input in 2K2 is just sinusoidals. Uh, but now when we add this real axis, we can deal now with you know, exponential inputs like we have in this case. And so instead of L J omega, it's just L times S, right? So as frequency increases, the impedance of an inductor increases, right? When uh, frequency is low, like a DC signal, an inductor is a short. When it is high, it acts like an open. In the opposite sense, uh, the impedance of a capacitor is equal to 1 over Cs, right? So its impedance value is really, really high when our frequencies are low. So when we have a DC signal applied to a capacitor, it goes to an open. When we apply a super high frequency signal to a capacitor, it acts like a short. So as frequency goes up, our impedance goes down, and it is the opposite for an inductor. As our frequency goes up, the impedance of our inductor also goes up. So for this scenario, because we have one ohms, one Henry, and one Farad, we're simply just gonna say this is one, this is one S, and this is one over one S. So we're gonna plug these values in, and we will have our circuit in terms of S. So this is one, this is S, this is one over S. Now, the question is asking us to find what the voltage is across this capacitor in terms of S. And in order to do that, we're just gonna perform voltage division. So to find our answer, V sub C of S, it is equal to Right, the impedance of our capacitor divided by the sum of the impedance of this series network. Right, We're essentially setting up a KVL loop and we're just taking the shortcut by performing voltage division. And then we're going to multiply that by our input. And so when we do that, we get 1 over S divided by 1 plus S plus 1 over S times 2 over S plus 2. So I can take this you know, 1 over S out and just kind of multiply it down there on the bottom side of my fraction or on the denominator, and I will get uh, S times S as S squared, S times one is S, and S times one over S is one. 
multiplied by two over s plus two. And they said not to simplify this expression. And so this is our, oh, this right here is the correct answer for this question. No, yeah, there we go. Correct answer for our equation. If we go over to our answer choices, it is right here, number six. And so just to review what we did here, uh, they gave us this series RLC circuit here with zero initial conditions, right? So we have a zero state response. And they wanted us to find the voltage across the capacitor in terms of S domain. So we converted the circuit into its S domain equivalent. We Laplace transformed this voltage source by using this. It's just one over S plus A. So it gave us two over S plus two. And then we found the impedance values of our resistor, inductor, and capacitor by using the equations here. The impedance of a resistor is just equal to its resistance value. Impedance of an inductor in terms of S is its inductance value times S. And for a capacitor, it's one over CS, right? So frequency increases, the indu or, uh, impedance of an inductor increases, and a capacitor decreases. Then all we did to find the voltage across our capacitor in terms of S is we simply applied voltage division. We just divided the impedance of our capacitor divided by the sum of our series network here, multiplied it by our voltage source in terms of S, and that is how we got the correct answer. Uh, and so that is pretty straightforward and a, a pretty, pretty cool question. That was, that was not too much, so there you go. Question two, in the circuit below, find V sub C of S in S domain. Assume the capacitor initial voltage V sub C of zero is equal to five volts. Note, do not perform partial fraction. Okay, what we have here is Laplace initial conditions applied to circuits. And so what they have given us here is this very simple RC circuit uh, with an exponential input 5e to the negative 2t that turns on when time t is equal to zero. Uh, and then we have initial voltage conditions across our capacitor of five volts. And so what they want us to do is to find the voltage across this capacitor in S domain. And so what we're gonna do in order to do that is we are gonna transform our circuit into its S domain equivalent. And because we have initial conditions, we're gonna have to do uh, some funky tricks in order to remodel how that capacitor will behave within our circuit in S domain based on its initial conditions. Once we do that and replace our capacitor with the necessary model, we're just gonna basically perform, you know, KVL or uh, KVL tactics, I guess. So we'll, we'll just say we're just gonna do voltage division and then just add we're just going to do voltage division, basically. Um, okay, so let's start off with transitioning this circuit into its S domain equivalent. So here, our voltage source is equal to 5e to the negative 2t u of t within time domain. And so in Laplace domain, uh, if we take the Laplace transform of an exponent, it's going to be 1 over s plus a. We have a coefficient of 5 here, so we're going to multiply that by 5, and our a value is equal to 2. So it's going to be 5 over s plus 2, right? We just Laplace transformed uh, the input voltage from time domain to frequency domain using this thing here. Next, our resistor just remains as 1 ohm, right? It is frequency independent, and its impedance value is not based on s. It's just its resistance value. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to replace this capacitor with a model that will represent um, how it behaves within S domain when we have initial conditions. And so the way that we're going to do that is the voltage across a capacitor, right? We want to represent this entire thing here as V sub C of S, what we're trying to solve for. And that is going to be, you know, V sub C of T in time domain is equal to one over C times the integral of the current through it, right? And so we have current coming through here, right? This is I sub C of T. And so within Laplace domain, what this is going to amount to when we have initial conditions, right? When we perform integration within Laplace domain, V sub C of S is going to be equal to um, one over S times I sub C of S divided by C uh, plus V sub C of zero from the negative limit. And when we expand this out, what we get is one over S C times the current plus V sub L of zero divided by S. And so this is the model that represents what V sub C of S is within S domain, right? Based on how we apply initial conditions uh, when we perform integration within Laplace domain. And so right at the bat, when I look at this, well, what is this first term here? Well, this is just Ohm's law, right? This one over S times C is equal to the impedance of a capacitor within S domain, right? So as our uh, frequency increases, right, within S domain, the impedance across our capacitor decreases, 
right? Because at really low frequencies, if we had a DC signal applied, it would go to an open. But when we apply really high frequencies, uh, our capacitor behaves like a short. And so this expression, we can just model this with some load that represents the impedance of our capacitor, right? And that's just one over SC, which is just one over S in this sense, since we have a one farad capacitor. Next, this thing that represents the initial voltage conditions, we can just represent as uh, you know a voltage source, right? And it's going to be positive, right? Positive for integration. And so it's just equal to V sub C of zero for the negative limit divided by S, which is equal to five over S given our specific initial conditions. So there we go. We have now correctly modeled how our circuit is going to look within uh, S domain, within Laplace domain. And the way that we did it, we should just performed Laplace transforms on all of our values uh, and how they behave within S domain. And so just as a quick and important port, quick important point, we replaced our capacitor with both of these models. The first representing just a load that represents the impedance of it, right, Z sub C. Then that next one is a you know an independent voltage source that represents how the initial voltage conditions influence this circuit. Um, and so to find V sub C of S, what we're trying to find, it's going to be equal to the voltage across both these components within S domain. And so how we're going to do that to find V sub C of S is we just need to find the voltage across this first load, which we'll call V sub ZC, since it's the impedance or something, I don't know, something like that. And then this next one, our, our voltage source representing our initial conditions, we'll just call VIC of S. And so for this first one, all we're going to do is perform uh, voltage division, right? So we can, because we have two sources here, we can just sum them, uh, how they interact with each other on a series basis. So this is a positive, and then we, we, right, we step up. And then as we come to this voltage source, we're going from positive to negative, now we're gonna step down. And so we can represent the entire independent voltage in this as the first one minus the second one. And so we can just do voltage division, right? So the impedance of the load that we're trying to find for, this specific one right here, divided by the sum of the impedance of the entire series network, multiplied by the total voltage within our series network, which is going to be V in of S minus this voltage source, which is V sub C of zero from the negative limit divided by S. And then we're gonna add on this one here because that is also included in the total voltage across our capacitor. And so that's just equal to V sub C of zero from the negative limit divided by S. And so when we plug in our values here, we get one over S divided by one plus one over S times, uh, what's this? Five over S plus two, right? The Laplace transform of the time domain equivalent of that voltage value, right, that exponent 5e to the negative 2t divided by 5 over s. Sorry, the fives and the s's, when I write them, sometimes look really similar, but 5 divided by s as well. Uh, and we just plug those values in. Uh, so then we can simplify this thing by multiplying this s down here. We get 1 over s plus 1. That's just algebra. And then we multiply it out by this term. Uh, yeah, and then we'll do it again. 1 over s plus 1 times 5 over s plus 5 over s. And there we go. That is the voltage across our capacitor in S domain. Sorry, I did not do that very fast. But nonetheless, our answer is right here, number 4. And so just to review what we did here, uh, this is a really simple RC circuit that they wanted us to find what the voltage across our capacitor was within S domain. And so in order to do that, we remodeled our circuit in S domain. But we had initial conditions across our voltage, and so we had to model it correctly by replacing it with, oh no, uh, model it correctly by replacing it with just a load that represents its impedance value, and then an independent voltage source that represents its uh, the effect of the initial conditions of the voltage across that capacitor uh, in S domain. And we did that just by essentially doing integration based on the IV characteristics of the capacitor within Laplace domain, and we got this expression, right, which this one is just Ohm's law, and so it's just the impedance value that we can represent with this current coming in, and then we have this one to represent how those initial conditions affect it. And so then what we did is we knew that it, the voltage across our capacitor was represented by the sum of these two elements that we added in, um, and we performed the voltage division. Uh, by just, instead of doing just V in, we subtracted that additional uh, voltage source that we added in there because it is in opposition to that voltage source and so it's going to be minus. 
and that's like the sum of our total independent voltage within this series loop thingy. Uh, and then we just added on the uh, the voltage of that independent source. We simplified, do algebra, answer, boom. There you go. Oh yeah, here are the models. <laughs> I'm not gonna go in depth on that, but that, this is the model that we used. Uh, and those are the models for other different scenarios based on the initial conditions values that you have and whether you're replacing a capacitor or an inductor. Uh, so there we go. Okay, question three. In the circuit below, the output V out of T consists of zero input response ZIR and zero state response ZSR. V out of T is equal to V out comma ZIR of T plus V out comma ZSR of T. Find the zero input response V out comma ZIR of T. Okay, what we have here is a zero input response question. And so they have given us this parallel RC circuit down here with an independent current, current source attached. And they want us to solve for the zero input response of the voltage across our circuit, right? So for V out of T, uh, we only have two nodes in this case since all these elements are in parallel. And so I'm just gonna refer to that as the voltage across our circuit because that is what it is. And so they have provided us this definition here where the complete response of our system, our voltage across our circuit, is equal to the combination of both the zero input response and the zero state response. And they are exactly what they sound like. The zero input response is the effect, of, is the response of the circuit when we have no inputs. And if we combine that effect when we have no inputs with the zero state response, when we have no initial conditions, right, we have no initial state uh, on our system, uh, we get the complete response. And so, right, in order to find ZIR, what we're trying to do here in this case is we're trying to model the effects of the initial conditions uh, on our system, the voltage across our circuit, right? We're not taking into account the input here, we're only taking into account the effects of these initial conditions values. And so, in order to solve to the zero input response, uh, what we're going to do is first we're going to get rid of our input, right? No inputs, zero input response. So we're going to uh, get rid of that current source by opening it. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna transform this circuit into S domain in order to correctly model the effects of these initial conditions. So in order to do that, let's, let's do it. Um, <laughs> so we're gonna get rid of this current source by opening it. And we just have our resistor here. And then we have our capacitor. And now in order to model this capacitor with the initial conditions given across it, right, V sub C of zero from the negative limit is equal to two volts we are going to insert a model that shows these effects. And so we have, you know, current flowing through here, right? So I sub C of S. And so, our, uh, well, we're in time domain still, but, you know, so we have I sub C of T, right? The current through our capacitor. And that is equal to the capacitance value times its derivative of its voltage value. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna Laplace transform this equation Ignore that you can't actually like just, oh, you can just do there. Okay, so we're gonna Laplace transform, and what we get is that the current through our capacitor in terms of S domain is equal to C times uh, S, V sub C of S minus V sub C of zero from the negative limit, right? That's just the definition of derivatives within the Laplace domain. If you don't remember uh, why the derivative of the Laplace domain is that, uh, Look it up on YouTube, it's pretty straightforward, or you use a lookup table. Anyways, when we simplify this out, we get CS V sub C of S minus C V sub C of zero from the negative limit. And this is equal to the current across our, through our capacitor uh, in terms of S. And so this is what we're going to replace this capacitor with in order to model the effects of the initial conditions on it. So how do we model this first term? Well, if you look at it, it's V sub C of S multiplied by CS, which in theory is, well, not in theory, it is equal to V sub C of S divided by the impedance of our capacitor, right? The impedance of our capacitor is equal to one over CS. And so therefore, this is equal to V sub C of S divided by one over CS, which is equal to CS V sub C of S. And so we can simply replace this first portion with just a model of the impedance value of our capacitor in order to represent the effect of that on the current, right? Because we can just use Ohm's law in order to, you know, find how that works based on the current, right? We multiply by the voltage or stuff like that. So this is equal to just Z sub C, our impedance. And now this next term here, negative CVC of zero, well, we're just gonna represent that as a current source, right? 
we're just going to add in some theoretical independent current source. And because it's negative, it is going to be pointing up in opposition to the direction of current flowing within our model. And this is just equal to V sub, V sub, well, V, no, shoot, sorry, C V C zero negative limit. And this is equal to one over CS, right, is the impedance of our capacitor. And that is this. Right, it's the same as 2K1, except we're replacing J omega with S. Right, as frequency increases, uh, the impedance across our capacitor decreases, as shown by that equation. Okay, so now what we have here is our thing in terms of S domain. And let's actually, let's model it with its actual values. So one quarter ohm resistor. We have this impedance value of our capacitor, which is equal to one over CS. We have a capacitor value of two farads, so this is one over two S. And then this current source is C times V sub C of zero. So that's our capacitance value two multiplied by our initial conditions two as well. So this is a four amp source. And so what this circuit here represents is, uh, yeah. What this circuit represents is the effects of the initial conditions uh, initially on our capacitor uh, and how that will affect the total output of our system, right, the total voltage across our circuit. So all that we're going to do here now is we just need to find what this voltage value is in terms of S and then we need to Laplace trans inverse Laplace transform that back into time domain. Uh, and so that's going to be equal to you know, V of S is equal to by Ohm's law the current through our circuit, if we simplify these two nodes, in, or these two elements into one, it can just be equal to our input current multiplied by our input impedance. And the input impedance is the combination of these two elements, right? The capacitor impedance and the resistor imp impedance. And since we're in parallel, we can represent this as the admittance one over y in, and therefore, because we are in parallel, we can combine our admittance values very easily by just adding them. And so this is equal to i in, which is four amps, multiplied by one over our admittance values. So it is the inverse of both of these terms, and it's just adding them since they're in parallel. So four plus two uh, s, and then this will be four over two s plus four and we can simplify this out into 2 over s plus 2. So here we go. This is the voltage or the uh, zero input response of our voltage across our circuit in s domain. But they want it within time domain and so all we need to do is inverse Laplace 2 over s plus 2 and we will have our final answer. So inverse Laplace 2 over s plus 2 is equal to 2e to the negative 2t. And this is equal to v out ZIR of T. And so the way that I perform this Laplace transform here in order to get our final answer of 2e to the negative 2t is that if you go up to this little thing they gave us here, we have something in S domain that is modeled like that, 1 over S plus A. And so therefore, we have an A value of 2 and a coefficient of 2. So it's 2 times e to the negative AT. And our A value is, of course, just 2. And that's how we get it. And so when we get our answer choices, it is right here. And so just to review what we did here, uh, they wanted us to solve for the zero input response of the voltage across our circuit here, V out comma ZIR of T. And what the zero input response is, is the response of our system, the voltage across our circuit, when we have no inputs. And so what we did is we got rid of that uh, current source, right? And then we transformed this circuit into its S domain equivalent in order to correctly model how these initial conditions impact the circuit and that's ultimately what the zero input response is representative of. And so we added in our resistor and then in order to model our capacitor in S domain with initial conditions uh, based on taking the you know definition of current through a capacitor taking the Laplace transform of that we got this and this first term is representative of just of Ohm's law right it is just uh, V over Z it's just like V over R but with impedance and so we modeled that just as an impedance value and then we subtracted CVC of zero, right? And so this is like the opposition of the initial conditions on our capacitor, right? And so it is negative going against the source and it is based on the capacitance value and its initial voltage and it was four amps going that way. And so, right, you know, if you had an initial voltage of two volts across this, you can notice that this would sort of 
cause a little bit of rejection towards the source as we have an increased voltage than if we had zero. And so that's why that is the way it is. So then all we did is we just combined these two into parallel and we just had a current source going through some load and we can just perform Ohm's law that the voltage is equal to IN times ZN. We made ZN one over YN because it's easier to just find the admittance because in parallel you can just add them. We multiply that by our current value, we got this. And then what we did is we took the inverse Laplace transform of that because this is representative of the uh, zero input response in terms of S. Uh, but we need it in terms of t, and so we just inverse Laplace that. We got 2e to the negative 2t, right? We have a coefficient of 2, an a value of 2. Boom. That is the answer. Um, so there you go. Okay, question 4. In the circuit below, find h of s, which is equal to v sub l of s divided by i sub n of s. Assume all initial conditions are 0. Okay, what we have here is a transfer function question, and so what they have given us is this series parallel RLC circuit, and they want us to solve for the transfer function H of S. Right, so the transfer function H of S is the Laplace transform of our impulse response of this system, and so therefore it is equal to the output of our system divided by our input of our system within S domain. And so they have declared that our output is the voltage across this inductor, so the transfer function is equal to the voltage across our inductor in S domain divided by the input of our system, which is this current source, I sub n of S. And so this is what we're trying to solve for. V sub L of S divided by I sub N of S, our output divided by our input in order to solve for the transfer function of this declared system. And so usually what we do for a V over I transfer function is we would just find the impedance of our network and do some funky tricks doing that. But the problem is we don't have the value uh, for I sub N, right? We don't know what this variable in our denominator is. And so in order to solve this, we need to get rid of I sub N of S and cancel out that unknown variable by getting V sub L of S in terms of I sub N of S. And how we're gonna do that is first we're gonna declare that the voltage across our inductor by Ohm's law is equal to the current through the inductor multiplied by its impedance value, which of course is just I sub L of S times SL, right? The impedance for an inductor is just s, the variable s, sigma plus j omega, times the inductance value. So in order to do this, we're now going to transform this value, i sub l of s, in terms of i sub n of s. That way we can cancel when we plug that value into our transfer function. And the way to find this in terms of i sub n is uh, we're going to do current division. So um, by current division, we know that the current through our inductor, right, the current through this branch here, since we have two parallel branches, right, the current is going to split across these two branches, and so the current through this uh, resistor is equal to the current through the inductor, and so what we're going to do is we're going to multiply our input voltage, in, excuse me, input current, times the impedance of the other branch, right, the impedance of our capacitor, divided by the sum of the impedance of the network, so the impedance of our capacitor plus the impedance of the actual branch that the inductor is on, so Z sub R plus Z sub L. And this is the current through the inductor in terms of I sub n. So I sub n of s multiplied or bleh, multiplied by z sub c, that is 1 over sc divided by 1 over sc plus just r plus sl. Right? So I just replaced the impedance values for capacitors, resistors, and inductors in terms of s. Um, so right for a capacitor, it's 1 over sc. As frequency increases, its impedance, dec impedance decreases. Uh, resistor is independent of frequency in an ideal model, and uh, our inductor, as frequency increases, its impedance increases. So let's plug in our actual values here, and this is going to be uh, capacitance value of 1, okay, 1 over S divided by 1 over S plus 0 0.5 plus S. We can take this S value down, and we get 1 over S squared plus 0 0.5 S plus 1, right, I just took this S down and then I, you know, played around with it. Oh my gosh, I can't use my thing. So this is the current through our inductor in terms of I sub n. And now we're going to plug this into this equation, the voltage across our inductor. And so we get that uh, I sub L of S is equal to I sub n of S multiplied by 1 over S squared plus 0.5 S plus 1 multiplied by S times L, right, the impedance, this is just Ohm's law, this is I times Z, I times R, but we have Z because we're fancy, um, well, we're using inductors, so S times L, not just S, 
And so when I plug in then this up here, what I get is that my transfer function is equal to s over s squared plus 0.5 s plus 1 multiplied by i sub n of s, right? This is the voltage across our inductor that we remodeled divided by i sub n of s. These two terms cancel. We don't know them anyways. And so h sub s is equal to s divided by s squared plus 0.5 s plus 1. And when we go to our answer choices, it is this one. I think, yeah, I think that's right. And so what we did here, just to remind you how I solved this, is uh, they asked for the transfer function of this system. And they declared that the output was the voltage across our inductor, and then our input was this source. And so the transfer function, the Laplace transform, of our impulse response is equal to our output, the voltage across our inductor, divided by our input, the input current source. But the problem in this case is that we have not been given the value of our input current source. And so what we need to do is we need to get V sub L of S, our numerator, in terms of I sub N of S in order to cancel, as we did up here, in order to solve for our transfer function. So by Ohm's law, we know it's equal to the current through the inductor times its impedance. And what we did is we performed cur current division in order to get the current through our inductor in terms of I sub N, right? So it is equal to the input current multiplied by the impedance of the opposite branch divided by the sum of the impedance of the entire network. And so what we did is we did that <laughs> and we uh, we replaced our impedance values, 1 over SC and SL and R, and then we plugged in the specific resistance, capacitance, and inductance values, and we got that the current was this. We plugged that in to this using Ohm's law. We got this. We plugged it in, we canceled out I sub n of s, and we got that our transfer function is equal to s divided by s squared plus 0.5 s plus 1. That's how we did it. Pretty straightforward, I think. I hope. Question 5. One of the transfer functions or pull zero diagram shown below represents an unstable system. Which one? Okay, we have a Bebo stability question. And so what they have given us down here is we have four transfer functions uh, and four pole zero diagrams, which are representative of some transfer function. Um, and so what this question is asking us to do is to determine which one of these eight systems is unstable. And when we were talking about stability in this case, we are talking about Bebo stability, which stands for bounded input, bounded output. And what that means is that if we apply some bounded input signal, meaning our input signal does not have infinite energy, uh, but it is bounded, right? It is within bounds. It does not go to infinity. If we apply a bounded input signal to our system and our system is stable, then we will receive a bounded output, meaning that our output will likewise not go to infinity either. It will be bounded. It will be within bounds if our, our system uh, is stable. If our system is unstable, then we will receive a unbounded output, meaning our output will go to infinity even for a bounded input, if the system is unstable. And so what we are trying to determine in this question here is which one of these eight systems uh, will have an unbounded output, meaning the output will go to infinity even for a bounded input. And so the way that we are going to determine this uh, is by looking at the poles of the transfer function. right? So the poles are the s values for which uh, the transfer function is going to be undefined, right? And so that occurs when one of when our denominator is equal to zero, right? So it is the s value uh, which sets one of these factors equal to zero. And uh, a way to visualize what these poles are, right, on these pole zero diagrams, is uh, remember that s is equal to sigma plus j omega. And so therefore, some function of s is going to be a surface, right? So just draw the z-axis here, right? So some function of s, a transfer function, is a surface plot, right? So you've got this, and then this is, you know, extending up and down the x-axis. Um, and so what these uh, x values here, these poles are, are the points on this surface plot in which, um, you know, it has infinite height. It is undefined. The surface comes fully out of the page. Um, and so the importance of these poles in determining uh, stability of our system is because these poles are equal to the natural roots of our system. So if you remember back to differential equations, uh, when we were solving for the homogeneous portion of um, some ordered system, right, we have second, third, fourth order systems in this question, uh, what we did in order to find the natural response of our system is we made a guess that our solution was e to the lambda t. And then we solved the characteristic equation in order to find what this lambda value is, right, the natural roots of our system. And those lambda values are equal to the poles. And so the natural response of our system uh, is determined by what the poles of our transfer function are. 
And so in order to determine whether our system is stable or not, we need to see whether or not the real portion of our pole is positive or negative. If the real portion, right, the sigma value is less than zero in our poles, then we are going to be stable. And the reason for that is because we are going to have within the natural response of our system, you know, negative roots, and therefore we're gonna have exponential decay within the response of our system, right? So, you know, if we have some sigma value of, I don't know, e to the negative two t within our natural response based on a pole of negative two, uh, or uh, would be representative of what the natural response of a system would be if we had a pole of negative two within our transfer function, then we would have exponential decay present within our response. And so therefore we would be stable because we would always have a bounded output for a bounded input because that exponential decay would take us onto equilibrium. On the flip side, if we have a sigma value, right, a real component of our pole that is greater than zero, we're gonna be unstable because in the natural response of our system, we are going to have exponential growth, right? We might have, you know, e to the 4t, right? We're gonna shoot off to infinity. And therefore, even for a bounded input, we are going to have an unbounded output because the exponential growth present uh, within the natural response based on the poles of our transfer function uh, will be exponential growth that's going to take us to infinity. And so what we need to do is determine which one of these eight systems um, has a sigma value that is greater than zero, and therefore we will have exponential growth present within the response of our system. Um, and so when we look at these questions, uh, let's look at the pole zero diagrams first, right? So to visualize this, right, this is on this side of the uh, complex plane when sigma is less than zero, we are going to be stable, right? We are going to have attenuation within our system. We are going to attenuate our input. Um, and likewise, if we have poles on this side where our sigma value is greater than zero, we are going to be unstable because we are going to have amplification present. And so when we look at all four of these pole zero diagrams, we know that all of them are stable because they all have poles on the left side of the complex plane, meaning we have a real portion that is negative, a sigma value that is less than zero, and therefore we're gonna have exponential decay present within our response. And we have no exponential growth because we have no poles that have a positive real value. So none of these are unstable, they're all stable. So then when we go to our transfer functions, uh, we can see that one, three, and, no, sorry. One, two, and four are also stable uh, because they all have the same denominator. And remember the poles are the S value for which uh, the denominator will go to zero. And so because they all have the same denominator, they have roots or uh, poles of uh, negative four with a multiplicity of three. And then this, these two are negative two plus or minus J three. And remember the imaginary portion does not matter because within the response of our system, right? This pole is gonna be E to the negative two T times E to the, you know, J three T. This is just sinusoids. And so we're gonna have sinusoids times the exponential K. And so we're gonna go to zero anyways. So the, the imaginary portion doesn't matter. All we care about is this real portion and it's negative for both. And so therefore we are stable. Uh, and so the, the correct answer in this case is that number three is our unstable system. And the reason that number three is our unstable system is that even though we have this one pole here that is negative, uh, these two poles here are two plus or minus J three. And as I stated earlier, the poles are equal to the natural roots of our system. And so when you plug that into you know solving the homogeneous portion, the natural response of our system, you're going to have a response of e to the 2t times you know, e to the j3t, which is sinusoids, but this exponential growth term is gonna take us to infinity even for a bounded input. Um, and so uh, if you're a little confused in the connection there, just let's, uh, let's, let's look at how a transfer function would relate into the response of our system. So if we did partial fraction decomposition on this transfer function here, right? let's look at just this s plus four term. We know that we're gonna have within um, h of s, if we decomposed it, you know, some coefficient over s plus four. And so then when we transform this by taking the inverse Laplace transform uh, and made it into time domain, we would have, you know, a e to the negative four t within our impulse response, right? This is going to be present within the impulse response of our system. And so then therefore, you know, any bounded input that we convolved with this, that we convolved with this exponential growth would cause stability um, because uh, that exponential growth is going to take our output to zero as we go to infinity and therefore it's going to restrict it from being unbounded, is going to keep it bounded. If that pole was uh, you know, positive and we had e to the 4t, well then that exponential uh, growth term in that case is going to cause us to be unbounded because it is going to take any bounded input signal and it is going to take it to infinity at the output. And so just to review what we did here, 
Uh, they wanted us to determine which one of these systems is unstable. And we're talking about stability, we're talking about BBO stability, which refers to uh, if we apply a bounded input, meaning our input is bounded, it does not go to infinity, it is not an infinite signal. If our system is stable, we will have a bounded output. That is what BBO stands for. If our system is unstable, we will go to infinity, right? Um, and so a good way to visualize this is a stable system is like a ball at the bottom of a cup. As long as we do not apply an unbounded input, right? We don't just shoot this to the high heavens with some infinite input, but we apply some bounded input, right? Like a flick, this is just going to oscillate up and down and return back to equilibrium, right? It's gonna go like that. Um, if our system is unstable, it's like a ball at the top of a hill. Even if you apply a very small bounded input, just a little flick to this ball, it is going to go flying off this hill and go to infinity. And so that's a good way to think about uh, what a stable system is representative of or an unstable system is representative of. And so then in application, in order to determine which one of these eight systems is unstable, we're looking at the poles of these transfer functions because the poles of the transfer function give us the natural roots of whatever order system we have. And so the natural roots are these lambda values that are plugged into this exponential value within the natural response. And so if we have a sigma value that is less than zero in this case, we're gonna have exponential decay present and therefore we're gonna be stable because our output will be bounded uh, for any bounded input. But if we have a sigma value, right, a real portion, the real portion on this uh, S on the complex plane axis, uh, greater than zero, we're gonna be unstable because we're gonna have exponential growth present within the natural response of our system and therefore it is going to take even a bounded input signal to infinity at the output. And so then all we really care about in this question is determining whether or not the real portion of our poles is positive or negative. If it's positive at all, meaning if we have any positive poles, it doesn't matter how many negative poles we have, um, we're going to be unstable because that is going to result in a response that goes to infinity even for a bounded input. So when you're solving these questions, uh, they should really only take about 20 seconds. All you want to do is look at which one of these eight systems has poles uh, with sigma values that are greater than zero. And so three right here, right? The pole is two plus or minus J3 um, because this is the value of S that will lead to the denominator being zero for those two factors. And so therefore we are going to be unstable because we're going to have within the natural response exponential growth that's going to take us to infinity even for um, a bounded input. I don't think that was the most coherent explanation, but nonetheless, there you go. All you got to do is figure out if your poles have positive values uh, on the real portion. If they do, unstable. That's it. There you go. Question six in the circuit below. Find V sub R of T in steady state. Hint, check resonance frequency. Okay, we have a resonance question. So uh, what they want us to do is to find the voltage across this resistor right here uh, based on the input voltage that they have given us and these element values. Uh, and they told us to check resonance frequency, which pretty much guarantees that uh, we have resonance within the circuit. So uh, what is resonance? Um, so on a, on a broad scale, resonance is when the frequency of the forcing function, the input to a system, matches the frequency, the natural frequency of that system. Um, and so applied to circuits in this sense, resonance is the frequency at which our input impedance, the impedance of our total network, uh, is purely real. Meaning that it is just equal to the total resistivity of our circuit and we have no reactivity. And so that occurs when the reactance of our inductor cancels out the reactance of our capacitor. So that means that, you know, R plus J, and then we say that you know, we add the impedance of our inductor and our capacitor, and if the impedance of our inductor is equal to, right, the, the magnitude of the impedance of both our inductor and capacitor are equal to each other and they are opposite in sign, then they will cancel out and therefore we will have no reactance present within our circuit uh, and we will be within resonance. And from that, we can then apply that in order to uh, do circuit analysis because there will be no impedance across both those values as their impedance values will cancel each other out um, as essentially at resonance the magnetic field stored here is going to exchange with the electric field stored here and they're just going to go back and forth through that and then magically there's no impedance across them and they both become shorts so let's uh, double check that this is in fact in resonance uh, and the way that we find that is right we just 
find the frequency value in which the reactance is zero. So in this case, the input impedance is equal to ZR plus ZL plus ZC. Uh, this is R plus J omega L minus J omega C. And so we just want to figure out what value of omega is going to make this term zero. So J omega L is equal to J omega C. Uh, omega squared is equal to J over J LC. Uh, omega not the resonant frequency in this case is equal to one over the square root of LC. And this is the resonant frequency for a series RLC circuit um, and a parallel RLC circuit. Um, and generally, that is the resonant frequency for most of the circuits that they will give you in this class. However, uh, that is not always the case. And so it is always a good rule of thumb to go ahead and find what omega value, uh, what frequency value will give you an impe input impedance that's purely real. Um, I once took the shortcut because I was dumb and I messed up on a resonance question that was very easy because it was a series parallel circuit and the resonant frequency was not one over the square root of LC. And so it made me very, very mad because I was just an idiot. Anyways, uh, is this actually in resonant frequency? One over the square root of LC, we have these values. 0 0.1 times 0 0.1 is 0 0.01. This is equal to 10, so the resonant frequency of our system is 10, and we have an angular frequency of 10 within our input, which means we are in resonance. And that means that there is no impedance across either of these two elements, and so they are shorts. And so this circuit is actually just this, essentially, or yeah. So the voltage across our resistor is just equal to the input uh, in this case, since our inductor and capacitors reactants cancel each other out, and so therefore there is no impedance across them, and so therefore they are shorts. And so therefore, uh, the voltage across our resistor, since they share the top two nodes are in parallel, is equal to our input. And so therefore, this is equal to our answer, uh, and it is right here. So. This is a quick review here. They want us to find the voltage across this resistor. And they told us to check resonant frequency. And so resonance is the frequency within circuits at which uh, the impedance is purely real, meaning that the reactance is zero. And so therefore, in this case, that means that the magnitude of the impedance of our inductor and capacitor are equal uh, but opposite in uh, sign. And so therefore they will cancel each other out. And so what we did in order to confirm what our uh, resonant frequency is, is we summed the impedances of our network. And this is the purely imaginary, the reactive component. Uh, and we found that the resonant frequency is one over the square root of LC. And that is equal to 10 based on these element values. And our input, uh, our forcing function to our system had an angular frequency of 10. And so therefore that means that this circuit is within resonance. And so the impedance of the inductor and capacitor is zero. And so they act as a short in this case as they just exchange the fields within each other and there is no reactance across them. So with that, it means that the circuit is behaving like this where there's just a resistor. Uh, and so the input voltage is going to be equal to the voltage across our resistor, right? There's going to be no phase shift and they share the same top and bottom nodes. And so therefore uh, they are equal. And so that's how you do this question. That was way too long of an explanation for a very, very simple, simple question. Question seven, uh, which transfer function H of S has the Bode magnitude plot shown below? Note the y-axis is in decibel scale and the x-axis is in logarithmic scale. Okay, we have a Bode plot question. Uh, so what this question has given us is a Bode magnitude plot. Uh, and that's what this graph down here is representative of. And so based on the Bode plot they have given us, they want us to determine which transfer function is represented by the Bode plot that they have given us. Um, and so for starters, what is a Bode plot? Uh, so a Bode plot is the frequency response of a system, uh, meaning that it tells us the magnitude of the relationship between the uh, output and input of a system uh, based on a specified input frequency. Right, so the x-axis of our Bode plot is the angular frequency of the input signal, uh, omega. And then our, um, our dependent variable, our y-axis, is the magnitude of our transfer function uh, in terms of j omega. Since we're just dealing with frequency here, we're just going to use the imaginary portion of s, right? Because that gives us complex exponentials and thus frequency. Uh, and that is in the decibel scale. And so what that is equal to uh, is 20 log base 10, uh, the magnitude of 
our transfer function in terms of j omega uh, within the linear scale. That's how we get into decibels. Um, and so just as a reminder what the magnitude of our transfer function is, uh, it is equal to the magnitude of our output of whatever our system is uh, divided by the magnitude of our input, right? And so uh, this Bode plot down here tells us, uh, you know, the relationship between our output and our input of our system uh, based on a specified angular frequency uh, at the input signal, right? And so, you know, it tells us how much our output is either amplified or attenuated uh, in relationship to the input at a specified input frequency, uh, right? And so you can use this to characterize passive filters or, you know, operational amplifiers. Um, and so it is an extremely uh, useful graph. But so anyways, what this is equal to typically uh, within this class is what we see, and as we see in our answers, uh, is the product of the factors that give us the poles of our system of our transfer function, right? So, uh, j omega minus, uh, what is it, are the zeros, right? And then this is divided then by this product of our factors that give us the poles of our system, right? The magnitude of j omega minus our poles. Um, and so when we take the log base 10 times 20 of this up here, uh, logarithmic function turns uh, multiplication into addition and division into subtraction. And so the uh, y-axis of our function here is then going to be equal to the sum of 20 log base 10 of the magnitude of this. And then minus, because we divided by the sum of our poles, uh, sorry, I write slow, uh, 20 log base 10. And so this is what the independent or dependent variable of our um, Bode plot is. And so when I look at this expression here, what I can tell is that uh, whenever j omega or whenever omega, our independent variable, uh, increases to be greater than our zeros, the magnitude of the zeros of our transfer function, uh, the uh, plot of our system, the slope, is going to increase by 20 decibels per decade when we pass a zero, when omega becomes greater than the magnitude of a zero. Uh, in the same manner, for our poles, we're gonna decrease uh, 20 decibels on the slope of our graph per decade uh, when omega becomes greater than our magnitude of our poles. And so from this, with these two information, two things that we know from the plot of our Bode plot, we can figure out what our transfer function is by knowing that whenever we pass a the magnitude of a zero uh, in our transfer function, the slope is going to increase by 20 decibels. Uh, and whenever we pass uh, the magnitude of a pole, the slope of our graph is going to decrease by 20 decibels. So let's go ahead and apply that to this graph in order to find what our transfer function is. Uh, so right off the bat, we can see that we have initial slope of 20 decibels. Uh, and so what that means is that we have a zero or this is indicative of a zero at the origin. So we have a zero at zero uh, because we have a 20 decibel slope coming out of the origin. Um, and so then I'm gonna go ahead and then mark the other points at which the slope changes in our plot. So at 10 to the zero, our slope decreases. At 10 to the two, our slope decreases. And then at 10 to the four, our slope increases. We'll do it in green. So uh, at 10 to the zero, our slope is now zero. So it's 20 decibels minus 20 decibels, uh, indicating that we pass the magnitude of a pole at 10 to the zero. So our transfer function has a pole at 10 to the zero, which is one. Uh, at 10 to the two, uh, we now go to negative 40 decibels, which means that we have passed two poles uh, at 10, 10 to the two, right? So when we pass a pole, we will decrease negative 20 decibels. If we pass two poles, we will decrease negative 40 decibels. And so therefore, we have two poles at 100. So 100, 100. Uh, and then it's kind of hard to see here, but at 10 to the four, our slope actually increases uh, 20 decibels relative to what it was. Uh, and so that is indicative of passing the magnitude of a zero at 10 to the four. So we have a zero at 10,000. And so from this, we can then just create our transfer function based on the zeros and poles that we have found given 
by the change in slope of our Bode plot. So the magnitude, or the, the transfer function, uh, which we're gonna do in terms of s here because we can just do that, is going to be our factors that tell us our zero, so s plus zero uh, times s plus 10,000. And remember, it's the magnitude of the zero, so that's why we do that. And then divided by s plus one for that pole. And then to represent the multiplicity of 200 poles, we're just gonna square this term. Uh, and then I'm just gonna take this s plus zero and make it into s. And there we go, this is the answer to the question. This is the transfer function uh, that is represented in the Bode plot they have given us. And our answer to this question is six. And so just to review what we did really quick here, uh, they gave us a Bode magnitude plot and they want us to determine what transfer function uh, is or has that Bode plot. Uh, and so the Bode plot is uh, the, shows the magnitude of the relationship between the output and the input of a system based on uh, the angular frequency of the input signal. And so this is in a decibel scale. And so therefore, the y-axis is equal to this. And so from this, we can recognize that whenever uh, our angular frequency, the independent variable, increases past the magnitude of our zeros, we are going to increase on the slope of our graph by 20 decibels a decade. And likewise, whenever our omega value becomes greater than uh, the magnitude of a pole, we're going to decrease 20 decibels per decade. Uh, and so when we go to our graph, we can recognize that we have an initial uh, slope of 20 decibels indicating a zero at zero. And then here our slope uh, decreases 20 decibels from what it was, and so therefore we pass the pole at one. And then it decreases 40 decibels uh, past 10 to the two, which indicates that we have two poles in our system at 100. And then our slope uh, flattens out and increases by 20 decibels relative to it was, what it was uh, at 10 to the four, indicating a zero at 10,000. We then plug in these zeros and poles into building our transfer function, right? And uh, remember that these are the magnitude values, and so this is the transfer function that we get when we solve this question. Uh, whenever you get one of these questions, all you wanna do is plot the points of where the slope changes uh, on the graph, uh, and that will give you your zeros if you have a uh, increase in slope, and your poles will be the points where you get a decrease in your slope, uh, and you can build your transfer function from that. So uh, there you go, that is how you answer that question. Question eight, shown below are the Bode plots of a transfer function, h of s is equal to v out of s divided by v in of s, when v in of t is equal to two cosine 0 0.001 of t plus 15 degrees plus three cosine 1000 t plus 45 degrees, find v out of t in steady state using the Bode plots. Note, in the magnitude plot, the y-axis is in decibel scale, and the x-axis is in log scale. In the phase plot, the y-axis unit is degree, not radian. Okay, we have a Bode plot question. So. Uh, what they have given us is a magnitude plot and a phase plot of a Bode plot, right? Representing the frequency response of a system. That is what a Bode plot is. It tells us the magnitude of our transfer function. Uh, and I'm using J omega here, uh, just because we're dealing specifically with frequency only. And so I'm just gonna use the imaginary portion due to complex exponentials, which give us frequency. Um, and so they have given us the magnitude plot of our Bode plot, which tells us the magnitude of our transfer function uh, at the specified input frequency, and the, uh, the y-axis of this plot is in decibels. And so what that means is uh, decibels is 20 log base 10 of something in the linear scale. And so from that, uh, these values of zero are represented of 10 to the zero uh, within linear. So that is one, negative 20 is a magnitude of 10 to the negative one in linear scale, negative 40 is 10 to the negative two, and negative 60 is 10 to the negative three, right? That's what the decibel scale is representative of. Then this second plot here, we have uh, the phase of our transfer function. And so this tells us the phase of our transfer function at whatever the specified angular frequency is of our input. Um, and so that will tell us how the phase shifts uh, between the input and output of our system. Uh, and so from that, what they have asked us to do here is they have given us an input signal, V n of t, uh, within time domain that is comprised of two cosine functions. And they want us to find out what the output of this system is when that is the input. And so just as a reminder here from this equation, uh, if we multiply the input of our system within S domain times the transfer function, we will receive our output. And so from this, uh, we can 
use that principle in order to find what the output is relative to our input using this Bode magnitude plot. And so um, we have two different cosine functions. And because we have a transfer function, this system is an LTI which means it is a linear time invariant system. And from that, that means we can apply the law of superposition where we can sum the effects of each input, the sum the effects at the output of each individual input in order to get the entire output uh, of the system. And that's what we're gonna do. We're just gonna isolate each input to our system. So let's go ahead and do this first signal first. So uh, two cosine 0.001t plus 15 degrees is our first input. It has an amplitude of two, uh, an angular frequency not, I'm not gonna, uh, of 10 to the negative three, and a phase of 15 degrees. And so what we're gonna do in order to use this Bode plot is we're gonna find at the angular frequency of 10 to the negative three, uh, we have a zero decibel uh, magnitude of our transfer function. And so what that means is that uh, the relationship between the input and our output in terms of amplitude is going to be one. And because we're just dealing with amplitude in this case, uh, we can know that our output is going to just be the same amplitude as our input. So it's going to be two cosine, same frequency, and then we need to find what phase shift will occur. So we're going to use this phase portion. And at 10 to the negative three, uh, we have no phase shift. And so therefore, the output of our system based on the input at this specified angular frequency is going to be the same as the input. It is going to pass it completely through, right? We have a magnitude of zero decibels indicating that there is no attenuation of our input signal at the output uh, and there is a zero degrees phase shift so there is no shifting of the signal. So then we're going to do that same thing for the second signal and the second signal is uh, three cosine a thousand T plus 45 degrees. So we have an amplitude of three, we have a angular frequency of 10 to the three, and we have a phase of 45 degrees. So we're gonna do the same exact thing we did on the last one. Uh, we have an angular frequency of 10 to the three. So we're gonna go to our Bode plot, and at 10 to the three, uh, the magnitude of our transfer function is negative 60, which in the linear scale is 10 to the negative three, which means we're going to multiply our input amplitude by uh, our angular, or uh, by 10 to the negative three, the magnitude of our transfer function in order to determine what the amplitude is going to be at the output based on that input. So this is going to give us an amplitude for our new signal of 0 0.003 cosine, same frequency. And then our phase shift here, we're gonna use the phase plot. And so at 10 to the negative, 10 to the three, we have a phase shift of 90 degrees, so we're simply just going to, oh, negative 90 degrees, yeah. So therefore the new phase is going to be negative 45 degrees at the output based on that specified input. And because it's linear, we can just sum these two, and this is our correct answer. When we get our answer choices, it is right here. So uh, just review what we did here, uh, they gave us some a uh, function with two cosine inputs linearly combined. And so from that, we know that they wanted us to find the output of the system. And so we can sum the effects on the output of both cosine functions independently. And so what they gave us is the Bode plot and they gave us the magnitude plot and the phase plot. The magnitude plot shows us uh, the magnitude of the relationship between the input and output. And because we're just dealing with amplitude, we can even within time domain, just multiply the amplitude of our input by the amplitude of our transfer function as given for whatever specified angular frequency it is for our input signal in order to get the amplitude of our output. And so we did that. Uh, we had zero decibels and so we re retained uh, our amplitude for that input. There was no attenuation. Then for this one, we multiplied it by 10 to the negative three as we had a magnitude of negative 60 decibels with which in the linear scale, right, uh, is representative of 10 to the negative three. So we multiplied three by 10 to the negative three in order to get the amplitude of this second output function. Uh, then we did the phase in the same sense. At 10 to the negative three, there's no phase shift. At 10 to the three, there's a nine, negative 90 degree phase shift. So we added zero here and there was no phase shift. And so the output uh, based on that specified cosine function is the exact same as the input as we have no attenuation and no phase shift as indicated uh, by our Bode plot. Uh, but there was a negative 90 phase shift at an angular frequency of 10 to the three. And so we shifted our signal back negative 90 degrees at the output, uh, and this was the outcome. And so 
If you got confused on anything, remember that this is in decibels here. And so these values represent, uh, you know, the relationship, the magnitude of the relationship between our input and our output. And so uh, in linear scale, negative 20 is 10 to the negative 1, negative 40 is 10 to the negative 2, negative 60 is 10 to the negative 3. That continues onwards. Uh, and so from that principle, we know that is the relationship in the magnitude of the two functions. And then the phase is just the relationship in the magnitude of those two functions. You put those together, you apply it, and you get number two as your correct answer. Question nine, the transfer function of the circuit shown below is h of s is equal to v out of s divided by v in of s, which is equal to one divided by eight times s plus one eighth. We would like to use a 20 ohm resistor instead of the two ohm resistor, keep the pass band gain unchanged, and increase the three decibel frequency from one eighth radians per second to eight radians per second. Uh, find the required capacitance value. Okay, we have a magnitude and frequency scaling question. And so they have given us this RC circuit down here whose transfer function is defined as the voltage across our capacitor divided by the voltage across our input. Um, and so they want us to magnitude and frequency scale this circuit into this new one based on the specifications they have given us uh, and find what the new capacitor value is within this new magnitude and frequency scaled circuit. So in order to do that, we need to find our magnitude scaling factor and our frequency scaling factor. Uh, and then we need to just find what our new capacitance value is, which is going to be equal to our old, uh, okay, old multiplied by one divided by our magnitude scaling factor times our frequency scaling factor. And that will give us our correct answer. So uh, the magnitude scaling factor is pretty straightforward. They changed this two ohm resistor to a 20 ohm resistor, uh, or they want to use a 20 ohm resistor instead of the two ohm resistor, which means our magnitude scaling factor is a factor of 10, right? So our new resistor value within a circuit that has been magnitude and frequency scaled is equal to our old one multiplied just by the magnitude frequency scaling factor, right? So in ideal circuit models within this class, uh, these resistor values are independent of frequency, and so therefore when we magnitude and frequency scale, all we do is multiply our old resistor value by the magnitude scaling factor. And so we have a new one of 20, an old one of 2, and so therefore k sub m is 10. Uh, next, they want us to keep the pass band gain unchanged, right? So this is a low pass filter, and so they want us to keep just this maximum uh, pass band, right, uh, at low frequency, that, that gain unchanged, and I believe if we magnitude and frequency scale in the right sense, that 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 won't be changed, so that doesn't matter. Uh, the next thing I want us to do is to shift our pull frequency from 1 8 to 8. So, right, we have a cutoff at 1 8 here, and they want us to extend that out to 8 by changing this pull. And so in order to do that, that means that we have a frequency scale within this new circuit of 8 divided by 1 8. Uh, that's just 64. So we have that. Now we're just going to find our new capacitor value based on the magnitude and frequency scaling specifications that they have given us. So 4 farads is our old one. Multiply that by 1 divided by k sub m times k sub f. 64 times 10, 640. Uh, 640, this is 1 16th times 10, 1 60th. Uh, and then 1 16th is... 6.25%, and then you multiply that by 10 to the negative 1, and you get 0 0.00625. Is that right? I think so. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So then there is our correct answer, and they want it in millifarads. Okay. Uh, this is equal to 6.25 millifarads, I believe. This is our new capacitor value. So when we go to our answer choices, it is right here. So just to review what we did here, uh, they gave us this RC circuit here uh, with a transfer function defined as the voltage across our capacitor. Uh, so this is a low pass filter. They wanted us to magnitude scale our circuit by a factor of 10 because they want us to change our two ohm resistor into a 20 ohm resistor and write our new resistor value is just equal to our old divided by whatever magnitude scaling factor we're using in this case. And so that's 10. Uh, they wanted us to keep the pass band gained frequency unchanged, write the maximum pass through this low pass filter at low frequencies. And so that is going to be unchanged based on the magnitude and frequency scaling that we did. Uh, and then they want us to increase the frequency, the pull frequency, right? This value here from 1 8 to 8. So that means we frequency scaled by a factor of 64, right? 8 divided by 1 8 is 64. I think, yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, and so then in order to find whatever our new capacitor value is, it is equal to the old capacitor value multiplied by one divided by our magnitude scaling factor divided by our frequency scaling factor. Uh, and so that's just equal to 6.25 millifarads. And that is the correct answer to this question.
From 10, in the circuit below, a transfer function is defined as h of s is equal to i sub out of s divided by v sub n of s. Shown below is the Bode magnitude plot of h of s. Find omega sub m, h sub m, and the pole zero diagram of h sub s. Note, the y-axis of the Bode magnitude plot is in linear scale. Do not use decimals. Okay, we have a Bode plot question, sort of. Um, so, what they have given us is this series RLC circuit, and they have defined the transfer function as the output current divided by the uh, input voltage. And so that, of course, is just equal to the input admittance, as they have alluded to here, right? This is just equal to I over V is just 1 over the impedance of our circuit. And so that is what this transfer function is defined as. And then they have given us a Bode plot, right, the uh, frequency response of this specified transfer function, and it is in the linear scale, unfortunately. Um, but nonetheless, what they want us to do is to find uh, omega sub m, h sub m, and then the pole zero diagram of that transfer function. So let's define what these terms are in the first place. So omega sub m is the frequency at which h sub m is maximized. And then h sub m, of course, is just the max maximum magnitude of our transfer function. And so just thinking about that, we want to determine at what frequency will the admittance of our circuit be maximized. And so therefore, because it is the reciprocal of impedance, we want to know at what point is our impedance going to be minimized. Uh, and so we have both an inductor and capacitor present, so therefore that is going to occur at the frequency of resonance. And so just as a reminder of what resonance is within circuits, resonance is the point at which our uh, impedance is purely real. And what that means is that the reactive elements, in this case the inductor and capacitor, their reactivity essentially are equal in magnitude but opposite in sign, and they cancel each other out, uh, leading to no impedance across them, and they essentially act like a short, uh, and so therefore the total impedance of our circuit is just a resistor, and that is when impedance is minimized, and therefore admittance is maximized. And so to determine what that is, we just need to find at what point is the reactivity of our impedance canceled. So this is a series RLC circuit, so the impedance is just the sum of their impedances. So that we want to determine at what point uh, is this reactive component of our impedance going to be equal to zero? And so that's when J omega L is equal to J omega C. Uh, omega squared is equal to J divided by J LC. Cancel square root. So our resonance frequency in this case, the point at which we will have purely real impedance and therefore uh, we will maximize the admittance of this circuit because we're only going to have resistance as our impedance. is going to be at one divided by the square root of LC. Uh, with the values we have, 0 0.1 times 0 0.1, the square root of that is 1 divided by 0 0.1. This is 10 radians per second. So omega sub m is equal to 10 radians per second, right? This is the resonance frequency. This is the point at which our admittance is maximized, right? That's what our transfer function is. Uh, and so then they want us to find what is the value of the transfer function when our angular frequency is at the resonant frequency. And so remember at resonant frequency, the impedance across these two elements is zero. And so this circuit is just behaving like it has a resistor. And they want us to just find what the uh, input admittance is in this case. And that's just one over the impedance. And the impedance is purely real. So it's one over R. And that is one divided by 0 0.1. And that is 10. So that is the maximum magnitude of our transfer function of our admittance. Uh, at the point of resonance. So this is equal to 10. Uh, last, what we want to do is find the pole zero diagram of H sub S. Uh, and let's just look at it. So basically all they want us to determine is there a zero or is there not a zero? Obviously, uh, even though we are in the linear scale, we know that there is a zero because straight out of the origin uh, on the frequency of this, we are increasing. And within the decibel scale, I would assume this is probably like a 20 decibel increase. Regardless, it means we have a zero at the origin. Uh, and then afterwards, of course, we decrease past the point of resonance, and it actually looks like it decreases faster, uh, which indicates we probably are decreasing at negative 40 decibels, or maybe even faster, I don't know. But regardless, uh, means we have poles at some point, and because we're in RLC circuit, we're probably going to have complex conjugates, right? Uh, and so this is what our pole zero diagram looks like. And, and really all they want you to recognize here in this case is that because we were at first increasing within our Bode plot, even though we are not in the decibel scale, uh, we know within the decibel scale that is likely representative of a 20 decibel increase past the origin, which indicates that there is a zero at the origin. 
So with that, uh, we have a omega sub m value of 10 radians per second, a h sub m value of 10, and this is what our pool zero diagram looks like. And so our correct answer is one. All right, uh, that was kind of all over the place, but just to review what we did here, they define the transfer function of this system as I out over V in of S, and that is equal to the admittance of our circuit as they alluded to. And that is equal to one divided by uh, our impedance, right? It is the reciprocal of our impedance. Uh, so they want us to find omega sub m, h sub m, and the pole zero diagram. So omega sub m is the angular frequency at which our transfer function is maximized. So at what point in this circuit, what, what frequency is going to maximize our admittance and therefore minimize our impedance? Uh, and that is going to occur at the resonant frequency, the point at which our impedance is purely real and thus purely resistive. And that means that the reactive components, right, the reactivity of our inductor and capacitor are going to cancel out with each other. And so therefore the input impedance is just going to be our resistor, therefore minimized and thus maximizing our admittance. And so we went ahead and found that, right, we just set the impedance of our inductor equal to the negative value of the impedance of our capacitor. And so our resonant frequency in this series RLC circuit is one over the square root of LC, that's 10 radians per second. Then they wanted us to find what the magnitude of that transfer function is at that resonant frequency. And as I stated, there is no impedance across these two elements as their fields are essentially just exchanging with each other. And they're essentially acting like a short. And so this frequency at our resonant frequency is behaving like this, it's just a resistor. And so therefore, the uh, admittance of our circuit is just one over R, right? It is equal to the conductance of that resistor. And that is uh, 10 Siemens. Uh, it is one over 0 0.1. So that is the maximum point of the magnitude of our transfer function of our admittance in this case. Lastly, they want us to find the pole zero diagram. And you could in theory probably like solve the transfer function or set up the differential equation in order to find the poles or natural roots or zeros or whatever. Uh, but we don't really need to do that in this case because they have basically just stead, said, your poles are here, do you have a zero or not? And we know that based on this linear scale Bode magnitude plot, we have a zero because at first, right out of the origin, we have an increase in the magnitude of our transfer function, indicating that, you know, J omega has passed the magnitude of a pole, or, or, excuse me, of a zero. Uh, and so therefore we have a zero at the origin. And then it makes sense that we have poles here in this case, since we're dealing with a series RLC circuit uh, with the specified values. And you could go ahead and solve if you want to, but you don't need to. That was kind of all over the place, but uh, there you go. I guess just as a final reminder, resonance occurs here, and it means that our impedance is purely real. And therefore, it means that there's no impedance across our reactive elements. And so our circuit is behaving like that at that point. And so H sub M is just equal to the conductivity of our resistor, and then we are increasing, and so we have a zero. Boom, there you go. Should be, should have covered all the fronts, I hope. I don't know. <laughs>